Pa, 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 pa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to episode 44 of the Strength in Words podcast. Today I'm speaking with Meryl Brown, a board certified music therapist and developmental specialist working with young children and founder and director of Developing Melodies Music Therapy Center in Bloomington, Illinois. Meryl, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Glad oh, to be glad here. here. <laughs> so I have asked you to come onto the show today to speak a bit about music, about why it's such a powerful tool and why it can be considered therapeutic for all infants and toddlers as well as their adult counterparts. Um, so first, let's just hear a little bit about you and what brought you to the kind of work that you're doing today. For sure, for sure. So my background is music education originally. Um, I went to school in upstate New York, SUNY Potsdam Crane School of Music to study music and how to educate the youth using, you know, uh, with music. Um, so while I was in school, uh, this is kind of the story of how I got to where I am. So bear with, <laughs> but <laughs> while I was in school, we were given opportunities for clinical work. Or, well, not clinical, sorry, education, but practicum work. So going into the classrooms and, uh, teaching the youth. Um, and we, in the general, um, uh, curriculum that we had in college, we got two opportunities to go into these classrooms. One opportunity was to go into a general music elementary school classroom and teach a lesson. Even though we were there for like eight weeks, we like kind of observed mostly. Hmm. And then the other opportunity was we were paired with an individual student to teach them a band instrument that was not your main instrument. So I went to school for French horn. I played, uh, I was to teach the flute. Um, and I was given that because I failed flute the first time. <laughs> Shouldn't be a band director or a flautist. But um, so those were the only two opportunities we really had in the classroom before we went to uh, student teaching. Mm -hmm. And I, there was no way I felt ready. So I kind of tried to figure out, and I, and I know things have changed now because uh, Crane produces some of the best music educators. So I know there are changes. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what it was, you know, almost 20 years ago when we went. So I kind of dug a little deeper and tried to figure out, like, how do I get in the classroom more? Like, I need, I need help. Um, I, I need help. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable as an educator as of yet, and, and I need to figure out. I do apologize. These are falling out. Okay. So, um, so I looked further, and there was a track that it wasn't a degree per se, but it was a, an additional certificate that you could get and it was education in, or music education special education mm -hmm. so i said hmm i wonder it gave you four extra opportunities to get into the classroom and work it happened to be with children with special needs mm -hmm. so i had all of these extra opportunities i'm now you know inundated with opportunity to get into this classroom and be with these kids and teach them music but you know, a couple semesters in, I wasn't teaching music. I was in a classroom, this specific classroom. It was a classroom of children with multiple disabilities, uh, anywhere ranging from third to fifth grade. And we had children in wheelchairs who were non-mobile. We had children who were non-verbal. We had children who didn't use their fingers. We had children who were blind. We had children who were, I mean, we had all of these children in this classroom it's upstate New York. Um, so, you know, you're limited in what you're, you have, you don't have a multitude of classrooms to put these kids in. So they're all in one classroom and I'm supposed to teach them music. I'm going to take this one out. Um, that's the one that keeps falling. So I couldn't teach them music. I mean, like it was just at the, where I was in my skill set mm -hmm. and what I needed to do just wasn't, there. I could not teach them music. But I realized that they were drawn to music. I had no idea what this was. And we started working on tracking, like visual tracking. And we started working on gait and gross motor movement and fine motor movement, all words that were foreign to me when I was an undergrad. But we had all this stuff. And, and, I, and I was using music. I was singing songs with them and using instruments and 
these kids were reaching and they were smiling and they were laughing and they were vocalizing. And I was like, what is this? Mm -hmm. I had no idea what music therapy was at the time. So now this one's falling out. So I went uh, to my um, supervisor. I I do apologize for the long story, but it's um, it's just you and me. So here we go. So, um, so I went to my supervisor and she goes, don't talk to me. Let me go talk to the dean. And I was like, "Uh, okay. Well, the dean happened to be uh, Dr. Alan Solomon, who was, um, who I have now learned, well, many years ago, but I learned, he was a board certified music therapist. We did not have a music therapy program at Crane, but he was a board certified music therapist. And he had also been, um, what I found out later, was uh, big in the editing world of our journal. The ones that are sitting right over there. Um, (laughs) So he, I went to speak to him and he said, oh, well, what you're doing is music therapy. And I was like, huh? And he's like, well, you're using the music, which is the motivator because of all of these facets, the rhythm, the, you know, lyrics, the pitch, all of that to motivate these students to do everything else that they want and should be doing and can do. And I said, oh, and he goes, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and that was kind of like our entire conversation was just like <laughs> oh yeah cool like and uh so that's what I learned and so I, I finished my degree I got my music ed degree and I was like had this in the back of my head like, music therapy music therapy no I want to be a band director though like that was cool and I got my extra classroom hours but I want to be a band director um I don't know why. And uh, so I graduated, did my, my student teaching. I graduated and I got a job immediately. Halfway through my student teaching, I was offered a job um, in the Syracuse City School District. Mm-hmm. And I was asked to teach uh, eighth grade general music. It was a, I don't know, I can't remember exactly if it was a leave position or something that they were going to create further, but it started in January. So it was only at that point a six month position. And in that six months, two of my eighth graders were pregnant. Two of my eighth graders uh, were killed in gang violence. Oh, my gosh. So these kids don't want to learn music. I mean, like, it's not, they are coming to this classroom grieving, fearful. They don't want to be in general music. You know, we sat at the time, um, there was a rap song. This was many years ago. There was a rap song that used a fur elise as mm. as the motif uh that mm. yeah yeah do, 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 do. and that's all they wanted to learn because they heard it on the radio in a rap song and i was like you know that's classical music and they're like Psh, i just want to learn the rap song but what i also found was that they again they didn't want to learn music but they had all of these emotions and they were using that music for something totally different mm-hmm. and in this side it was self-care in mm-hmm. this side, it was grieving. Um, so it was at that point that I called my dean and I said, okay, where do I go now? And so he said, apply to these schools or whatever. And and it, those two months were kind of foggy for me, but um, I applied to some schools and I got a phone call from uh, where I ended up getting my master's degree, Illinois State University, and entered their music therapy program, graduate program, and learned that this is exactly where I needed to be. So the long story short is that's how I got from point A to point B in central (laughs) Illinois from a a born and bred New Yorker. Um, (laughs) And and I found that that was the best decision. It was the smartest decision. And I can help so many more kids Mm -hmm. for me not doing music education. Like I had to remove myself from music ed. Right. Oh, so fascinating. And I love because we all come to the place where we end up in, in such fascinating ways. And that what a great story. I love that. Um, so I have seen and heard the term neurologic music therapy. Um, can you tell us more about that? What what is that? What does it mean, Meryl? So where um so when I finished my grad work, um, I went and got my developmental therapist licensure within Illinois State. 
and I started to see that I had a lot of letters after my name. Um, so it was Meryl Brown, MM, MTBC, DT. And so I, I made kind of a quest for myself to um, get as many letters after my name as, per, as possible. Uh, so I found, um, no, but it, I mean, I joke, but it was kind of true. Um, I figured why not have the whole alphabet, right? So neurologic music therapy is an additional training. It's an advanced training that music therapists can get. Um, okay. There are several out there. Uh, there is, you can further your studies in NICU music therapy. You could further your studies in improvisational music therapy. You could further your studies in hospice music therapy and bereavement, childbirth, doula, all this different stuff. Um, I chose neurologic music therapy because I have a weird fascination with the brain. Um, I am not a genius by any means with the brain, but I, I like I really enjoy learning more things about it. So I went through neurologic. And what it is exactly is they took everything we already know and they made these very these 20 um, very standardized clinical techniques. So okay. um and they can be used to address sensory motor, um, speech and language training, uh, cognitive training, all of that. Um, but they're very specific. So for example, one of them is uh, called RAS, and it is the rhythmic auditory stimulation, mm. also known as gait training. So mm -hmm. this is what we're using. These are when you see all those videos on YouTube by non-music therapists, but could possibly be music therapists, like this is what they're working on. Like, oh my gosh, look, he's walking with his walker. We, that is a standardized clinical technique that um, we use and it's even billable by insurance. Shh, don't tell anybody. But uh, we're facilitating the rehabilitation of motor skills. Yeah. Um, so that's one of them. Uh, we are also, it's not just gait training, but you can use it for um, uh, other movements as well. So arm movements and finger dexterity wow. and stuff like that. And there's other stuff as well. Another one, and this is really good for like the parents and the stuff that we use um, as parents, because I am a parent. Uh, developmental speech and language training through music. So acronym DSLM. And this is really just the specific use of developmentally specific uh, appropriate musical materials to in, uh, enhance the speech and language through singing and chanting and playing instruments and combining music, speech and movement. So this is, it, mm -hmm. this is basically what we do. Um, as early childhood music therapists. So this is kind well, of and, important. And funny enough, this is exactly what we do in any, whether we're music therapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, or infant toddler teachers, this, or parents, yeah. <laughs> actually, <laughs> we are, we are using that sort of multimodal, multi-sensory approach to teach language, to, to help encourage movement all of that to to understand concepts right this is this is why infants and toddlers learn holistically meaning that when we when we engage all different kinds of learning that's how that's how they learn it's right? multimodal is the way to go and that's yeah you know the the only difference between a parent using this technique and a music mm -hmm. therapist to using this technique is the parent has no idea they're actually doing like what exactly. they're doing, you know, exactly. Um, and, and yeah, yeah. They're so doing. the developmental basis, <laughs> exactly. Right. Oh, that's great. Very, there, yeah. Very so that's a few of them. So that's kind of where I went with the neurologic music therapy um, at the time. So that's great, Meryl. <laughs> so, okay. So you mentioned a couple of the, like the, the gate training or tell me again what it's called. Uh, rhythmic um, auditory stimulus. Right. So rhythmic auditory stimulus and the other, as far as speech and language, what are, what are some of the ways that music functions as, um, as a habilitative or rehabilitative tool? Yeah, for sure. So it kind of works in both ways. Uh, the beauty mm -hmm. of music is that it's processed 
all over. You know, where lyrics is processed on one side, speech is somewhere on the other side of your brain. And using the music helps to bridge these two gaps and create these new, you know, functional patterns within our brain. Um, probably, and that's both habilitative and rehabilitative. I mean, that's that's both. When we're working with infants and toddlers, I'm working with kids who haven't lost skills. They're just learning skills. So it's not rehabilitative because they never had them. Uh, so we are giving that to them. And so we are utilizing exactly what it is. One of, actually a really cool one is cochlear implants. Children cochlear with implants. cochlear implants. Yes. Um, I have a bunch of friends who are really, really hardcore researching how music therapy and cochlear implants bridge the gap. Um, and how these kids are, are learning different pitches and different sounds and different ways that they can now speak and, and right. produce sound. Um, and for anyone speaking. who is unfamiliar with what a cochlear implant is, essentially, um, it's, it is a, an auditory tool in, in the case when a child or an adult, uh, is deaf, severe to profoundly deaf, um, and uh, needs uh, basically stimulation to create the ability to hear, and it goes straight into the into the auditory nerve, straight into the brain, and bypasses the ear, and so it creates um, the ability to hear for someone who cannot hear, essentially. Yeah, and it's stronger than what a hearing aid could produce. Yes. Um, and, and it's different too. Uh, so, so that's kind of one of those, they're using all of these different techniques, not necessarily neurologic techniques, though it's all encompassing, but they're, they're using a variety of techniques and instrument play and instrument timbres. So utilizing a different instrument to mimic, um, another sound. Uh, so, you know, the, the art of being able to hear a tambourine or a, uh, versus an egg shaker or a drum to produce those hard consonants as opposed to a, a shaker where they are more um, fluid and soft. So, uh, but music is rehabilitative. So we're, as I said, we're connecting those, recreating those pathways in the brain um, when we're using it in a rehabilitative manner. Probably the most famous story is Gabby Giffords. Abby Giffords, yeah. who, yeah, so she was shot and lost speech function. She couldn't speak. Um, and music therapy was one of the first therapies administered with speech therapy to help her to regain her speech and recreate those neurologic patterns. I think there was something on the news um, had her singing like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star is one of the first things we saw on, on like the nightly news. And um, she was with a music therapist doing that because that music is processed in such this way that you can, you know, Parkinson's patients, Alzheimer's patients, they can sing it before yes. they can speak it. Um, yes. So we're, we're, you know, seeing that. So <laughs> amazing. Uh, it's so cool. Ah, and I get, I actually get shivers down my spine when I, when I think about the power of that. It's awesome. It's, um, it's pretty amazing. Right, so <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsors, and then we'll hear more about some of your favorite tips and resources, Meryl. For sure. Do you want to provide an enriching environment without all the plastic bells and whistles? Do you want to know how to stimulate your infant or toddler's growth and development? Are you tired of trying to do this all in a vacuum? We were not meant to parent in isolation. That's why I created the Strength in Words Community Lab, a content and community hub that brings you peace of mind. You have what matters when you need it most. Bite-sized morsels of developmental information, activity ideas to apply right now, parent support groups grouped by your child's age, developmental music classes, unprecedented access to professionals and special guests like the one we have today, and an active, engaged community of members just like you. The Community Lab is an all-in-one resource that isn't one-sized-fits-all. 
to take your free one week trial and join us for everything I've just described, as well as member access to Q&A sessions with the featured guests I bring on to the podcast, come check out community.strengthenwords.com. Okay, Mara, let's hear your three best tips for parents and caregivers of infants and toddlers, regardless of that child's developmental levels, uh, developmental level, when, when you're using music to connect with or support their young child's development. Well, you know, I'm not going to lie. Um, this was really hard <laughs> because they are all things that we already know. We just don't realize that we know. But um, th those are yeah. sometimes the most powerful and more most exactly. important things. And I, yeah. and I was like, well, I got to pick something tangible. So first and foremost, <laughs> the, the, my best tip for infants and toddlers, sing with your child, sing to your child, sing with your child, sing. They don't care what your voice is. They've heard your voice since they were in the womb. Yeah. They don't, that, that's the first sense that is, that is a uh, birth that is created. Um, is yeah. hearing. So it, they know your voice and they're not judging it. There is no judgment. They don't get it's judgment it's until they're like, you know, five or six. So th right. there's, that's, you know, when mommy go away, you know, actually maybe three, cause mine's yeah. probably, <laughs> yeah, she tells me to do that a lot. Stop singing. No, you know, one of those, but, but no, sing with your child, sing to your child. Um, that, just Why? just sing <laughs> uh and and i'll be i'll be the first to admit that i don't sing with my children as often as i um as i should uh i know the power of music i know the benefit of music i know what music therapy does and yet i don't use it at home um <laughs> because because you're a parent <laughs> right i'm a parent and um so i i, I get that but you know sing uh, I get a lot of, it, this probably should have been a short answer to this question, but but I, I get a lot of parents sometimes who are like, oh, diaper changes are awful. And my kid is like rolling here and there. And one thing we never really had much problem with in our house was diaper changes. And, and I do realize that that is the one time that I always use music. And, and we sang about what we were doing with our diaper. Mm -hmm. And it was... Mm -hmm. We all do it, whether you're a therapist, whether you are uh, not, we are all singing the steps to, you know, everything. And, and we make it up as we go along. And the song is different every time. But the fact is, it's something that the kids can focus on. So sing to your yes. So that, so that's the, so the, so the key takeaway there is sing because it, it focuses it's the vocabulary for what we're doing. And in fact, when we're talking, we're, we're also engaging in a very musical type activity, right? Because especially when we're talking to our infants and toddlers, we're often using a term called infant directed speech um, or motherese or parentese, which is by its very nature, slowing down, using exaggerated pitches, um, being essentially more musical with our voices uh, because we know, and I have a podcast episode about this specifically called Infant Directed Speech, mm -hmm. um, be because we know that they attend to it. They are, we're often just using this and doing it naturally, um, but it, it, it actually makes our children more interested in what we're saying. Oh yeah. When we oh yeah. This. And, and there's nothing that pairs better with speech than, than using it musically because that's just it, it is natural that's how we do it we phrase naturally with both mm -hmm. our speech and songs it's just it's yeah. it's it happens um yeah. so yes i firmly believe you need to sing to your <laughs> child um so my second one and this one as i said these were really hard um live music live music live music, live music. And I'm not talking like bring your kid to a fish show or um, I, I got married at a fish show. That's kind of like my claim. Um, but I have never brought my kids to one. But, but I'm not talking about that live music. I'm talking about live music. Engage with your child in live music opportunities, whether it is going to your library, um, going to a music class, but 
the live music opportunities are the most important. Anybody can go and stick a CD in a CD player and think that they're entertaining their child. And that that kind of came out really mean, but it's the truth. Well, Your they, kids are, they are entertaining that. their child. Yeah, but they are. Why, what, what is it about live music that, that is different? So live music, because of what you can do visually as well with live music, it becomes- Say that, sorry, say that one more time. Because of what can happen visually with live music, it becomes multimodal, which is how these children are learning. When you put a CD into the CD player, sure, the kid can dance around, that's fine, but that's all they're doing. They are experiencing music from the outside. They're like, okay, I hear music, I'm dancing. They are not paying attention to speech. They are not paying attention to, you know, you, you were most likely not going to teach your kid to speak just playing a CD. But right. pair that with a live music experience where you have the visual of here, <laughs> you have the visual and emotion, you have the visual of the movement. So now we've got that and then you've got the movement you've got the feeling you've got the tactile you've got all of that so so that is a huge experience live music will give you those things recorded mm. music won't give you all of those things um and so i i am a big believer of that and when i when i well i guess the the next question i know is what it what is going to be is what my favorite resources are but but this kind of, they, they merge. The tips and the resources kind of merge. Um, when you're looking for a music class, choose a music class that has that live aspect of music. Um, so just- Meaning what? Because in my, in my eyes, all, all music classes are, are live. What is, what is the live so aspect? So the live aspect is the facilitator of that class Mm -hmm. is using the music as well. Mm -hmm. So there are some, okay. yeah, there are some music classes out there that will, and, and, you know, sometimes the, that's what you have in your community and you mm -hmm. don't always have a skilled musician with kids available in your community. So library programs are often using a CD and, and again, uh -huh. yeah, that's great. Go, go and do that. Cause you should experience that. But you now have to take what you have heard and bring that back to your child live. You mm -hmm. sing what you heard and bring it to your child to make it multimodal. Um, right. So when, what I'm hearing is it's that interaction. Mm -hmm. That's the key. Yeah. 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 Between parent and child, child and facilitator, mm -hmm. child and instrument, child mm -hmm. and child. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a whole lot that goes into a lot of these things. So, and studies show that, that there are studies out there that when people are participating in live musical experiences, mm -hmm. whatever they want to happen will happen that much faster. Yes. And we actually happen to have live online, I know. live online music, um, music classes yes. through the community lab, which is so fun. Yeah. And it's great because I bring, I bring parents and babies up on, on stage or whatever on the, on the yeah. screen with me, and then we'll do something specific together. And it, it's just fun. Yeah. Just fun. I think that's a great way to use technology and how you're doing it. Um, Thanks. you know, and, and, the, and when those parents bring that back there, you've added, you know, of course, cause we're, we're, you know, we're online. We're not, touching and feeling but but you yeah. are touching and feeling and then with we, your child exactly yeah. exactly yeah. and that's a huge a huge thing so yes yay um okay give us your third tip so I'm my excited. third tip <laughs> don't sing down here <laughs> right um so children i told you these were really hard um <laughs> but no when you're singing kind of put your voice in that yeah. higher register because that's what kids are hearing. They're still developing their hearing skills. They are still developing, you know, all of those different pitches. And when the high pitch is what they're going, not don't sing up here, you know, don't, we don't want that. But we want, you know, if you're singing too low, it's not in that child ease, that mother ease, that yeah. daddy ease pitch right. um you want right. that to be attainable for your child so 
choose music that is in that pitch. Choose music to sing that is in that uh, kind of what, what my speaking range and a little bit above. Interesting. So. And you're saying that that is because then it is sort of innately more encouraging for them to try it out or or yeah. do it. Yeah. And that that's so interesting. I've never actually heard that quite said quite like that. Um, but it's totally true. And we know there's so much research that actually says that uh, even very young from like six or seven months, infants um, will attempt to try a new skill when it is uh, moderately difficult. So not too easy and not too hard. And they, so they will decide based on what they hear, what they see, what they feel, whether something is going, whether they should try it out mm -hmm. or whether they should imitate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if something is like you're saying in the example of singing in a pitch that, or a pitch range as in a little higher, a little higher where, where infants and toddlers and young children speak because yes. they do use a higher register because yes. their larynx is actually much smaller, right? Yes. <laughs> um, that, that if we sing up there, they are actually going to be more likely to imitate and interact musically as well. Yeah. Fascinating. Girl. Yeah. That is so cool. it's It's more encouraging. And mm -hmm. for the exact reason that you said, they can't produce the low sound. So what's going to motivate them to repeat it when you sing row, row, row your boat gently down the street down there? Like they're not going to do it. They might think it's funny when you're doing it in song and you want mm -hmm. to mimic. So we sing like um, we'll sing a shaky egg song and it's just really easy. Stop and go, you know, shaky, 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 shaky. I mean, like that's it. I have yeah. sold like the thing is two bucks online, right? I've made some site a long time ago. I've sold more of that song that you could probably imitate on your own than anything else that I've ever had. It's kind of funny, but anywho, that song, that's the link to it, right? Uh, I, I, I might not have, but I will try and get that to you. Yeah. And, uh, um, so, uh, the, but in that song, we imitate, we give the uh, instructions. And so we'll sing in the instructions and we'll sing, you know, can you shake it up high, up high in the sky? Can you shake it down low? And then, because physically they can grasp that low, but they're not going to vocalize that. They're right. most likely. So, so keeping in that range, that's you know. Um, okay. So, well, all right. So here's here's a question. Yeah. What about what about dads who have low voices? What do they do? Well, the kids know your low voices. Um, I, you know, I have not researched that or read a ton of research on daddy voices versus high mommy voices. And there are mommies out there that have low voices and there are daddies out there that have high voices. So, um, but the kids are going to um, tune in to the voice that they recognize. So mm -hmm. if daddy is singing that, they know daddy's voice. They've known daddy's voice since they were down here. They know daddy's voice. So they're still going to attune to, you know, and and have attention towards that. I don't hmm. know what the research says. I'll be honest. I don't know what the research says about that. But I do know that they will pay attention to a daddy's voice when it's their daddy. If it's not their daddy, they're less likely to pay attention to it. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I don't hmm. know. But I also tell my daddies to sing a little higher. Yeah. And my husband, right. used even, to, yeah. even a person with a low voice can sing yes. a little higher. And my husband used to be a music teacher. He has a low voice, but when he was working with those kids, you bet he tried his best to sing an octave up. He did right. what he could okay. to yeah. get in their range. Yeah. We're talking about the key or the, the octave, not, not putting yourself in way up here. Oh, gosh, right. No. If you have a low voice in general. No. Okay. I mean, kind of where my voice is right now. And that's hard not on musicians to understand pitch and things like that. They, if they haven't been trained, I get that. And so I mimic that. Like when I'm doing, uh, you know, our developmental music classes here in the studio, I am, and when I'm working with my clients one-on-one, -on -one, I'm singing in that range and I'm showing them, hey, try this. Can you bring it up a little bit? You know, hey dads, I, I don't get a lot of dads that work with me sometimes. Actually, although right now in my caseload, I have tons of dads, which is awesome. 
but um, I don't always get the dads. I get the moms, but I, I, I model what I want them to do. And that's mm-hmm. huge because you can say this, but they have no idea what you're talking about. So we model it. We make sure that, Hey, this is what it is. And I do provide recordings for my families when mm-hmm. they want it. And so they can still model that, that is the recordings are not so they could sit there and play it on repeat. The recordings right. are so that they can learn it and they can do it with their child for that live musical experience. Yes, exactly. Uh-huh. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, just to wrap it up, let's hear um, about a few of your other favorite resources. For, for sure. Parents interested in using music regularly. Yeah, for sure. So one of my favorite resources, as I went through this whole speech about live music, one of my favorite resources is um, Barefoot Books. And I don't know if anybody knows Barefoot Books, but it is um, a uh, publisher, I guess, of, of children's stories for all ages. But part of those, there are these musical stories. And I, I, uh, I don't have one on me, unfortunately, to show you. But um, what I love about them is they are books that come with a CD in the back. The music is printed in the back, but the story itself is really cool. So, um, one of them is, uh, driving my tractor and it's driving my tractor down a bumpy road and in my trailer, there's a heavy load. There's a little gray donkey going, hee haw, hee haw. And it has all of these, um, you know, animal sounds, but other things and, but it's musical. One of the reasons I like that is because I do have a lot of parents that are scared of music. They are scared to music as a verb. Yes, they are scared to music. Um, And this gives them a little bit of a cushion to do that. So they have a story, which we all know the power of books. It has the music. You now know the power of music. And it also has a visual component, which is wonderful. And the kicker is they have all of, most of their music books have a YouTube video. And I'm not a big proponent of YouTube, except these are the books animated. So it's the yes. exact picture that you're seeing in this story. So if you have to utilize something, because my kids watch YouTube. I mean, my kids like love videos. They're right. not zombies in front of the TV, but they love to look at things. And so this yep. gives them just a, a another area, another avenue to, to get that. So I, I do love these barefoot books, musical stories. So that's one of the first things I tell some of my new families. I think that's great too, because we all need tools to help us um, become more comfortable with things that we are less comfortable with. Right. So that, that is a nice bridge as well. Like you said, Mm -hmm. very cool. Um, What else? Anything else? Another one is my early blog. (laughs) Oh, cool. Go back two years and I was really, really blogging, but um, there were a lot of activities out there that I actually have four resources, but, but there are a lot of activities that I had put out there as a new parent. Um, this is when I had one child and a whole lot of time on my hands. Um, and I was also a stay at home mom with my child for about a year. So I was able to do these, but there's some great activities that we did there, both musical, non-musical, and it served as a really good resource at that time. The blog is still there. Um, you can get through it to, from my website and then just go back like four posts and then you'll be two years ago because I haven't (laughs) blogged in a while. Um, It's coming back. Don't worry. Um, But uh, so that's that resource uh, on developingmelodies.com. Another one is sprouting melodies. Um, So there is in the music therapy world, we have a whole slew of different um, developmental music classes and trainings that you can go to. This actually, though, is a blog. Uh, there is a training, but the Sprouting Melodies blog and a YouTube channel that they have, mm-hmm. and I can get you those links, but there are videos on there from a music therapist, and she is teaching the parents how to music as a yes. verb, um, how to music, which basically makes you one with the music and the development, and, and it's there are songs on there, there's tips, there's tricks, and that is my newest resource, um, out there that, uh, that I think is amazing. And I direct my families to. Oh, good. I can't wait to yeah. direct people. there too. Um, and as I said, there are four. And the fourth one is actually the parent, you, the parent, um, go back in your mental history and your file of facts and remember what you did as a kid. Um, no, I can guarantee that there is music in your lives. 
I can guarantee that there was something that your parent did to help you get through something, learn something, or move past something. Um, mm. So remember that. And it may not have been musical. It may have just been something that they did. But but they're, you are a great resource. Don't doubt yourself. You are a parent. And there's a reason you are a parent, because you can do it. <laughs> so... I think that's great too, because we, you know, we all have, sometimes it takes looking in one of like a collection of nursery rhymes to, to remember like, oh my gosh, I, you know, my grandma used to sing this to me or, or say this rhyme every time she, you know, took me here, or whatever it was. But, but when we have access to things like that, I mean, just go to your local library, go online and Google search, you know, uh, nursery rhyme children's nursery rhymes and you will find so many of those yeah. um that's great thank you meryl yeah thank, thank you so much thanks so much meryl and thanks to all our community lab members who are here listening live we will continue the discussion and open up for a q a session for you guys in just a minute but for everyone listening from home or on the go thanks so much for joining us and we will see you next time thank you